In the 1980s, a new deadly virus was discovered. Its name, HIV, AIDS. At that time, many also believed that it will turn out to be a pandemic, which luckily it didn't. But there was a very fierce discussion at the time whether or not healthcare workers have the moral obligation to treat patients with HIV and put their own life at risk. World famous surgeons publicly announced that they would not operate on HIV positive patients. And the National Commission on AIDS shared shocking numbers. Only 10% of internal medicine residents were strongly committed to care for these patients, while 30% of physicians were very reluctant. A study in 1990 looking at basic cardiac life support instructors showed that only 40% of them would perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in patients who were suspected to have AIDS. But with time, the research, the medical community, and the general public learned to live with the disease, and now we also know how to treat them without putting ourselves at risk. But some things never change. Healthcare workers will always be at the forefront of humanity in the battle against viruses. And they will always be the ones who are at high risk of infection. And clearly part of limiting the fear against infection stems from knowing more about the modes of transmission. And we're also seeing this, of course, now with the COVID-19 crisis. There's a lot of uncertainty and speculation before we can probably say that we figured it out. So here's what we do know about COVID-19 with respect to getting infected. Since its inception in late 2019, many were certain SARS-CoV-2 is a droplet infection. And as it evolved, others suggested it may be airborne. To evaluate just how complex it is, let's take a closer look at droplets and aerosols. Aerosols are liquid or solid particles of below 10 microns that can travel in the air for a while before landing on a surface. Droplets are larger than 20 microns and due to that, fall to the ground or surfaces faster. Aerosol particles below 5 microns are small enough to penetrate the alveolar space, potentially causing pneumonia. When liquid components of droplets dry, certain climatic conditions, such as wind or temperature, can turn those into droplet nuclei, which act like aerosols, allowing the droplet to travel further. While it is now widely accepted that transmission of SARS-CoV-2 occurs primarily through droplets via fomites and hands, it is less clear which role airborne transmissions play. In this cloud of uncertainty, most organizations, such as the World Health Organization, agree that there is an increased risk of infection, especially in specific circumstances and settings in which procedures or support treatments that generate aerosols are performed. This includes endotracheal intubation, bronchoscopy, open suctioning, manual ventilation before intubation, disconnecting the patient from the ventilator, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, tracheostomy, and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So when it comes to performing life-saving procedures that generate droplets and aerosols, how do you pick the right method and what's the best practice? In COVID-19 patients, we would like to reduce all procedures uh, with the risk of aerosol production. So we would like to reduce procedures like bronchioscopies, like suctioning the airway or changing the respirator um, tubes. Um, furthermore, we would like to reduce all procedures regarding stool, kind of stool collection, all of these things, because we know there is viral load in COVID-19 patients. And the third thing we would like to reduce is all measurements regarding transport of patients. So we would like to keep them stationary in one room or one ward. CPR produces huge amounts of droplets and aerosols, but on the other side, it's an invaluable procedure. So if you want to perform CPR, you have to follow the following steps. Shout at the patient and look for signs of life and normal breathing. To minimize the risk of contamination, do not use the standard look, listen, feel method, 
but instead feel the carotid pulse. Call for help and if available, attach the defibrillator. If you are not adequately protected, try one shock to possibly reduce the need for chest compression. Turn it on and analyze the rhythm. If shock is advised, administer a shock. Do not start CPR without a fully donned PPE. Place your hands on the patient's chest, start chest compression, and use a fitting mask to prevent aerosol generation. Have a colleague place the ventilator mask on the patient's mouth and nose. Ensure a tight fit to minimize aerosol spreading. Prepare for intubation as soon as possible. When you are acting in a team with advanced airway capabilities, do not bag the patient, but prepare for intubation immediately. Stop CPR when intubation is performed. Do not continue compressions during intubation. Continue CPR after successful intubation. Follow resuscitation guidelines. With a severe case of COVID-19, the gas exchange units in the lungs become infected. They respond by pouring out inflammatory material into the alveoli. Once these are inflamed, fluid and inflammatory cells pour into the lungs, resulting in pneumonia. With the lungs unable to get enough oxygen to the bloodstream, the patient would need respiratory support, starting with an oxygen mask. While using CPAP is simpler than intubation and usually the next step in treating respiratory distress, it has its disadvantages. We are safer if the patient is intubated, if the circuit is closed, if there is a filter in place, um, so we actually can reduce our protection level to FFP2 when just um, changing some lines or anything. Um, but we have to keep in mind that all the circuits have to be closed and that there is always a risk of kind of um, breaking a circuit and then the aerosol would be set free and then you have high risk of infection again. When intubating your patient, make sure you have all the equipment you need. Respirator bag, filter, Mask in the correct size and peep valve. Also make sure the oxygen line of the respirator bag is connected. Next, make sure your respirator is functioning and all the tubes are present. This might include a CO2 line. For the intubation itself, you need a laryngoscope. A video laryngoscope is recommended if available to minimize patient mouth opening and thus spreading of aerosols. You need an ET tube, a stylet, and a syringe for cuffing it. Keep your Plan B devices in close vicinity usually a supraglottic airway. Once your airway is in place, you want to fasten it with some sort of tube holder or tape. And if you have to disconnect the tube, make sure you have a plastic clamp available. You need medication for rapid sequence induction and you should have a trash bin close by for the disposal of infectious materials. Before entering your patient's room to manage an emergency, 
Make sure the roles in your team are clear. You're going to need a team leader, an experienced airway manager, one assistant, and one colleague without PPE to hand you equipment from storage if needed. Once inside the room, explain the plan to your patient if possible. Put on your pre-oxygenation tool and put the patient's head in a 45 degree angle, if this hasn't already happened. Follow your local SOP for pre-oxygenation without using high flow oxygen, or if the patient permits, wait for five minutes. Perform rapid sequence induction according to your SOP, or use what you have best experience with. Do not bag the patient once they have stopped breathing. If you absolutely have to bag them, use very low tidal volumes. Wait until the patient is fully paralyzed, then perform intubation using a video laryngoscope. Use an endotracheal tube with a stylet or bougie for safe performance and place the tube at an adequate depth. Remember to hold on to the tube as the assistant inflates the cuff. Connect the filter to the ventilator bag and also connect the CO2 line. Check the correct positioning of your ET tube using ET CO2. Do not auscultate your patient. Once you're sure the tube is in the correct place, fasten it using tape or a tube holder. If you have to disconnect the tube at any time, remember to use a plastic clamp before disconnecting. Only use a plastic clamp if the patient has no spontaneous breathing efforts. Once you have reconnected the tube, remember to remove the clamp. In conclusion, resuscitation and air management are probably the procedures that put healthcare workers at the greatest risk of infection. Know how to perform them correctly and practice. Now, let me also end on a very personal note. Healthcare workers have been on the forefront in this battle against COVID-19 and Despite the immense difficulties that they faced, there was a huge amount of solidarity among healthcare workers and also support from the communities and from the public. This was extremely heartwarming. Now, we at 123 Sonography are a company that actually deals with the teaching of ultrasound and not so much on virology and epidemiology. But just as the textile industry is now producing masks in the fight against COVID-19, we thought We'd provide lectures that aid you in the battle, inform you, and help you to protect yourself. I do hope that we were able to contribute at least a little bit. I want to thank all those who helped to make this project possible. And also, thanks to you for watching. Maybe we'll see you in one of our lectures dealing with ultrasound. We were as diligent as possible in providing accurate facts for this video. As the data on the pandemic keeps updating, we recommend staying informed through reliable and credible sources on a daily basis.